Today's lesson is entitled Hunting Hospitality. It is, uh, it's the practical advice. If you've been here and you're wondering, when's he going to talk about hospitality? Because I haven't talked very much about the what. As I said, we, we focused very much in parts one and two on the, the why. Um, as we get into today, let's back up, remember where we've been in part one and two. I want to remind you first what I mean by hospitality. Uh, I think what the, what the Bible means by hospitality, what Christians should mean by hospitality. Christian hospitality is lovingly providing and caring for those who are not your family as if they are your family, especially with your home. So where, where do I get that from? Just as a way of reminder, if you remember the, the Greek word, this was not a Christian word. This was a, a Greek word that did mean use hospitality. Hospitality was something that was esteemed in the culture. Uh, somebody would show hospitality and... Uh, they were esteemed, and if you didn't show hospitality, it was a shameful thing, just culturally. But the word for hospitality uh, is a combination of two separate Greek words. The first one, philo, Philadelphia, brotherly love, and the second one means strangers. It's, it's a combination of two words, brotherly love towards strangers. That brotherly love word was one that was used in, in that time to speak exclusively to family members, love between family members, not just friends. It could be used in like the nation of Israel to be describing uh, love among kinsmen, but generally it was, it was most often reserved for family love in a home towards strangers. Um, and so in Christians who have been adopted, it says taken, if you remember, taken from the household of we were God's enemies, we were children of wrath, even described as Satan's children, and made God's children, made part of the household of faith, the household of God, it was very, very understandable. Very, it was built into the word for the Christians to say, that's ours. That describes us. Hospitality is our word. It's brotherly love towards strangers. And if we look at all of the commands in the New Testament to hospitality, and there are, there are quite a few uh, teachings about hospitality, but, but three main areas of, of command where that hospitality is used, you see very clearly that love is tied to it. And our love for others is always tied to God's love for us. And so we see that love for others and even Christian hospitality has to be descriptive for a Christian. 1 John 4.20, consider this as, as I read, this, this is sobering, uh, it should be motivating, evaluate you, evaluate yourself in the way that you relate to others in light of this, 1 John 4.20, if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So you see in the hospitality commands, Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. This is a love for one another, pursuing hospitality. 1 Peter 4.8 to Christians, Peter says, Above all, 
be fervent in your love for one another, that's going to flow out in hospitality. In Hebrews 12, that's Hebrews 13, I'm sorry, typo. Let the love of brothers continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality. We, we learned brotherly love cannot be disconnected from hospitality. And if you love your fellow Christian, even those you don't know yet, like a brother, it would be really weird to not use your home. Right? If you told your brother, your real brother, oh, I love you, your parents, I love you, your kids, I love you, you're my family, you, you can't come in my house. There's, there's some disconnect there. Our homes are not off limits for our brothers and sisters in Christ. They, they actually should be home base for our ministry. Our very lives. It, this isn't limited to your home. The, the home, especially in our world, how often do we, it is just abnormal in our culture to have people in our home. That's, that's our fortress, right? Garage door goes down, opens only to let us out, goes down again. We go out, do our stuff, open the garage door, close it. This is our place. Not so for Christians. Alexander Strock says, unless we open the doors of our home to one another, the reality of the local church as a close-knit family of loving brothers and sisters is only a theory. I think that's true. And it's not limited to your home. It's your life. Right? Our love for one another can't be compartmentalized to sterile coffee shop environments or, you know, superficial, maybe even deep conversations out in the, out in the, the walkway, the breezeway out here. And then you say, you have a need. Oh, I'll pray for that. Go your way. Be warmed. Be filled. And you don't take care of those needs. That's not the kind of faith that saves. That's not the kind of faith that describes the Christian. And that must not be the kind of relationships we have to one another. So just finally, a, a way of review. We're still reviewing. I just wanted, because we're going to be speaking practically today, and I am so, I just know in my heart, if I disconnect the practical from the theological. If I disconnect the what from the why, I mess it up. God doesn't get the glory. I do. I get weary. It all of a sudden becomes not worth it. Um, other priorities sneak in. But when something so critical as hospitality is tied so clearly to the gospel, all of a sudden we remember that this is worth it. And we must, above all, be fervent in our love for one another, being hospitable. So next slide, I, I wanted to review just what we went through last week. Just to, if you hadn't been here, we're not going through all these points, I wanted to remind you or whet your appetite to go back and listen to this, that everything we talk about practically has to be rooted in the gospel. This Christian hospitality imitates God's love in the gospel. It reveals God's love in the gospel to others, and it spreads gospel love. And then we went through using those three hospitality command passages, as well as a few others, some descriptors of Christian hospitality. We must know and be motivated for the, by the why of hospitality because it is a defining trait of Christians. If we say we love, we have to do it. 1 John 3, 17, just listen. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? This isn't saying you have to give your stuff away in order to earn God's love. It's the opposite. You have 
needs and you have received, or you have goods and you've received God's love, what does it say about your faith? Have you actually received the gift of forgiveness, a gift that far exceeds the value? Forgiveness, reconciliation, adoption, a gift that far exceeds the value of whatever, whatever you may have to give away in care for a brother and sister in Christ. And when you're reconciled to God, you are now related rightly to the world's goods. You don't view them as, oh, this is my only life. I need to get as much stuff as I can to enjoy it for my sake, for my good. You now recognize every good gift, every single thing that you've been given in this life is a gift from God. So as each of you has received a gift, use it. Spiritual gift, physical gift, use it. It's not yours, it's God's. And what does it reveal about you if you see a brother and sister in need? God sets you in front of them in their life to care for those needs, and you close your heart to them. Compare James 2.15. We covered this last time. I, I just want you to feel this before I give you commands. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and you say, go in peace, be warmed and filled, and you don't give them what's necessary for their body, what's, what use is that? James asked in the verse before, can that faith save you? No, it can't. Because we are indeed saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But if you have true saving faith, that faith is never alone. That faith is always accompanied by works. Works that God prepared beforehand so that we can walk in them. Works that are enabled by the Holy Spirit in us. Works that reflect Show God's love, not earn them. This salvation is not of works that no man may boast. But when we are made new, we are made new by God for good works that we may walk in them. So I wanted to look, open up your Bibles to Acts 2. In light of this reality that Christian hospitality imitates, reveals, and spreads gospel love, we know that Theoretically, theologically, I spent an hour last week going through that. We've covered some of why um, hospitality, use of our goods to help brothers and sisters in Christ is a defining trait of Christians. I want to see this in action now. This is the natural and necessary response to the gospel. So as we go back to the, the very foundation, the first Christians in Acts 2, the early believers modeled a love for one another that was unmistakable. And it was through their care and provision for others, especially those outside their immediate families, that made the world take notice and watch the connection to people believing the Christian, the church growing, needs being met, and then the church growing more, right? The, the showing hospitality is a way to take care, to reflect gospel love to each other. But the watching world notices, and it expands the gospel message, and then reconciles more to God and gets us more <coughs> brothers and sisters in Christ to whom we can show this gospel love. So Acts 2.36 Jesus has just gone to heaven. Holy Spirit came down on, on the disciples. And Peter goes out. It's Pentecost. He's preaching the gospel proclamation in Jerusalem on Pentecost, saying that Jesus was the promised Messiah. The Jesus that his hearers had crucified was their only hope for salvation. 221, he says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They knew that. That was in the Old Testament. And then he says who this Lord is. 236. 
Let all the house of Israel, these are the people listening, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now look what happens in 237. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles, and to Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then a problem happened. 239, 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. 3,000 needy people, 3,000 people with stuff, people who had not been family before, now brothers and sisters in Christ. 3,000 strangers united through repentance and faith by this gospel message. Strangers to God made God's children, needs and all. These murderers of the Messiah were now brothers through Uh, through and by grace, through faith. They were united by God's love to now love one another and look at the effect. True hospitality. Go down to 44, 244 of Acts. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here, the early church is described as a community bound together, not just by shared beliefs, but shared lives. It wasn't a surface-level hospitality. It's sort of uncomfortable to read that. It, It was a sacrificial, joyful care for one another. Everything changed when the gospel entered their lives. Everything. They would not have been characterized by that before. Now and immediately, their relationship to God changed. Their relationship to each other changed. And the way they used their stuff together, the way they used their homes together, showed it. The believers lived out their faith by treating others, especially those in need, as family. But it didn't stop there. We're going to skip through, but I just want you to see some of the arc of Acts in the early church. Acts 4.4. So skip two chapters ahead. After Peter and John healed the lame man and preached in the temple, look what it says. Remember, so we had 3,000 added to their number in chapter 2, and then day by day, more were being saved. Now by 4-4, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Men only. Okay, and the believers were described as being of one heart, 432. So skip down to 432. So we had 5,000 people, all distinct, and somehow that large of a number was being described as being of one heart and soul. They shared everything they had, ensuring that there was not a needy person among them. This wasn't about communism or forced sharing. Right, a a sharing, it's actually Ananias and Sapphira in the next chapter shows the danger of pretending to show hospitality, pretending to use your stuff, your home, your property for good. Well, it's clearly about, hey, look at me. Uh, That's dangerous. That that gets you dead. But getting, if if you are from the heart, you're affected by the gospel and you're saying, hey, we have, we're united, one heart, 5,000 of us or 500 of us, united as brothers and sisters in Christ, having all things in common, not forced, but out of genuine love from the heart for one another that flows from a genuine love for God, that flows from his genuine love for us. There wasn't a need among them. That's remarkable. It was natural. 
It was actually supernatural. That this was the mark of the Holy Spirit in the people. That this has to be the mark of the Holy Spirit in us. Maybe not in exactly the same ways. They weren't driven by some external mark. We have to meet this standard of hospitality and check all these boxes. It wasn't that. It was, we're brothers and sisters. I see a need. I have stuff. Let me meet said need. If you have a whole church of people doing that, it makes sense that you'd say there was not a need among them. Not, not that there was no needs. There was no unmet needs among them. Because God put people in their midst to meet the needs. And he was glorified. And as a result, more and more were added to their number. This is attractive. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It's a way to help people understand the gospel message. When they see something different, you you won't save anybody through hospitality. You actually need to share the words. Hospitality isn't even primarily something you show to outsiders to get them in, to, to get them saved. It's we are changed in our relationship to one another. You can use your stuff for outsiders. But Galatians 6, I think it's 15, let us not grow weary of doing good, <clears throat> for we'll, we will reap in due season if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. And so as outsiders see us loving each other as family, they can understand God's love. And the gospel, when we preach it, makes sense. So by, the, by chapter 6, or so we saw in 432, uh, the believers were described as being of one heart and one soul, and there were many added to their numbers. Acts 514, following the signs and wonders performed by the apostles, it says, and more than ever, believers were added to their numbers, multitudes of men and women. So first 3,000, grown to 5,000 men, and now multitudes. And then by Acts 6, it says, now in those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenist. Hellenists. So the Hellenists were Jews. At this point, the church is, is almost exclusively Jewish. That, that will change in Acts 10. But the church is almost exclusively Jewish. And so the Hellenists, these are the, uh, the Jews that were not native to Palestine. They were the spread out in the diaspora that were, were uh, coming back back together in Jerusalem or, or in other areas, they were being overlooked. All of a sudden, sort of racism, culturalism entered into the church, and the church says, from the apostles down, that can't happen. Because their widows, the, the Hellenist widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so when the needs of widows were being overlooked... And remember what James said, true godly religion is, if you're a doer of the word, not a hearer only, uh, you're going to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. It's just this. If you say you love, and you don't take care of those in need, what kind of love is that? And there were widows here, and they were being overlooked. And the apostles appointed prototype deacon leaders. It was so important that the church meet the needs of the neglected. The apostles preached the word. They said, we have to preach the word. We have to pray. Because if they didn't know this gospel, it, that would be almost assured, an assured way that they wouldn't live rightly together. The apostles are given to preach. Pastors, teachers, given to teach so that the body cares for the body. And that's what happened here. The apostles taught and they appointed past, or they, <clears throat> the apostles taught and they appointed the prototype deacons, seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they appointed them to ensure that the church was showing hospitality. They didn't just let it happen. They made it happen. They organized it. They said, there's needs that are not being met. We need to make that happen. We need to take care of it. This is hospitality in action. It's seeing and meeting needs of those who might otherwise be forgotten. 
And then what was the effect? Look in 6, 7, Acts 6, 7. The word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and even a great number of the priests became obedient to the truth. Uh, just big picture. We could, we could look at other examples, but I, this is a sweet one. Acts 9, 36, we meet Tabitha, also called Dorcas in Joppa. Her life was marked by charity and hospitality. When she died, the widows who she served showed Peter the clothing she had made for them. Tangible evidence of her love and care. It's sweet. We see big picture. Oh, yeah, all the church was caring. And then you just get a little glimpse onto one. The widows are saying, Tabitha, she made us clothes. She, she loved us. Her care for widows, like they were her family, left a lasting legacy that we get to read about today. Um, use of homes, Acts 10, Peter's invited, called to the home of Cornelius. The church takes a monumental step towards um, uniting Jewish and Gentile, crossing Jewish and Gentile boundaries. We talked about this in week one, Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, Gentiles, but your fellow citizens along with the Jews, saints, and members of the household of God. Um, that is a, a remarkable and necessary step towards showing hospitality, showing treating those who are not your family as family, even if they are not Jewish. For, for Jews, that was a big deal. Uh, it, we don't show hospitality just to those who are like us. We've been united across cultural, across all boundaries to become members of the household of God. I can keep going. I just want to comment Acts 16. I, had, I could have done a whole message through Acts on the way that homes are used. I just, I just think as we're looking at it practical, you believe the gospel, your home is not off limits. It's home base. It's just sweet when you see in, in Acts 16, um, Lydia, a new believer, immediately opens her home to Paul and his companions, showing how hospitality becomes a natural response of a transformed heart in united people. Later in the chapter, the Philippian jailer does the same, inviting Paul and Silas into his home after they share the gospel. The, the big summary of this, it's like, where are you going? Why, you're not even started yet with hunting hospitality. Uh, the, the big take home is that gospel leads to hospitality and it's not random. It's not purposeless. It's actually specific. It meets needs. It is closely connected to believing the gospel message and the expansion of the gospel. The hospitality of the early church wasn't just a nice addition to their faith. It was evidence of it. Their love for one another proved that they belonged to Christ. Right? Like Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. If you have love for one another. They welcomed strangers. They cared for the needy. They treated others as family, not out of obligation, but because they had been transformed by the gospel. The Bible does not have a category for letting hospitality just happen. We're warned in Hebrews 13, don't neglect it. Peter says our hospitality has to be rooted in fervent love. And Paul in Romans 12 says you are to hunt it, to hunt hospitality. That, that might sound weird, I actually think this is the way that it was designed to sound in Romans 12. So open up your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we've talked about this, how all of these commands from 9 9 on, uh, especially 9 through 13, are, are under the, the command of let love be genuine. 
How do you let love be genuine? Well, by abhorring what is evil, outdoing one another and showing honor. And then it ends with contributing to the needs of the saints and seeking your, ver your version in verse 13 of Romans 12 might say pursuing hospitality. It is the result, whatever this word seek, pursue means, it is the result of a fervent and zealous love. We see genuine love, I, I think it crescendos through brotherly love, through preferring one another, through some generalities into some specifics. It crescendos to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek, pursue I think this word is not, it's not wrong if we translate it, hunt. It's actually helpful. Hunt, hospitality. That word, it literally means to run after something. Seek, pursue. That, it, it means the same thing in English, but maybe not in quite the same startling way. It describes a tireless, purposeful running from place to place in order to find something. In classical Greek literature, it is actually used in the context of hunting. It describes the attitude of like a hound, a dog chasing a fox through the forest, or, or maybe a better picture is a, a cheetah chasing a gazelle, right? A cheetah doesn't meander after a gazelle. It chases it, it seeks it, it pursues it. This word naturally in its most common use isn't, oh, try to do something. It's actually hunt after like an animal, hunt after something like you're hunting an animal or an animal's hunting another animal. Um, throughout the Greek, New Test Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, it's actually most common, even primarily used of hostile soldiers in pursuit. It's, it's weird because you don't normally associate hunting or like pursuing, like hostile soldiers pursuing an enemy. It's, dis, it's incongruous to say, oh, I'm going to pursue you to do good. It's startling, and I think it's meant to be that way. Paul uses this word positively on a pretty regular basis. But there's not a whole lot of evidence of others doing the same. So when Paul says, seek to show or pursue hospitality, he does not mean, perhaps you should be open to the possibility of being hospitable if the opportunity arises. Or don't refuse if you're asked. As Paul would say, may it never be. The virtue of hospitality is far from being passive. Right? You saw that in the early church. It, it makes sense from all of the commands. These are not passive, let it happen commands. They are active, pursue it commands. We, as Christians, and specifically, I'm talking to Grace Bible Church, I'm talking to myself. We better go after it chase it down, not stop till we have wrestled it to the ground. To try to just let it happen is to actually misunderstand and refuse to obey the command. This is a command in scripture that applies to us. It requires zealous, vigorous, strenuous effort. It is rooted in love. Love must have practical outworkings, and a practical outworking must be contributing to the needs of saints and hunting hospitality. This word, hunt, is, is actually when you think of Paul using it here. Paul used it in a different place, too, in Acts 26.11. He said that he was zealous, right? Just like our love's supposed to be, Paul was zealous. But he was exceedingly enraged. And he hunted Christians, even into foreign lands, 
completely dis- devoted to destroying them. Paul changed. You changed. How sweet is it that Paul, who, who described in his testimony to his former life in Christ, says, oh, I, I hunted Christians to kill them. Christians hunt each other to show love. When Paul was out pursuing Christians, standing by as Stephen was killed, he didn't mind the trouble that it cost him to go from city to city, to make plans, to get groups together. It it did require inconvenience, planning, time, and money to go hunt Christians, to kill them, to imprison them. But it had become his life goal because he believed it was necessary for the glory of God. And he was willing to spend almost any expense to accomplish that in pursuit. So often those who do evil are more zealous for their own cause than those who do good. That ought not be so. Paul does not want this to just happen for the church. Only the active and ardent pursuit of hospitality is glorifying to God. John Murray, in his commentary on Romans, speaking to this verse, says, We are to be active in our pursuit of hospitality, not merely bestowing it, if perhaps grudgingly, when necessity makes it unavoidable. We begrudge, more, we begrudge hospitality more often than we would like to acknowledge. One might see a new family in church and should feel some obligation to ask them into his home. <clears throat> Sorry, I just lost. But he waits until the last possible moment, hoping someone else will invite them first. I've done that. Have you done that? It's a hard day. I don't feel like it today. And then if no one else does, and he's still feeling up to it, he then reluctantly extends the invitation. According to Paul, this this idea seriously misunderstands the command, the glorifying of Christ and the grace of God in general. The hunting word for seek, pursue. For me, it's been quite helpful to remind me of what I'm doing when we come to church. It's shorthand in the car for for why. It's shorthand for my heart, for what I'm doing when I come to church, when I pray for the body. This must be descriptor of me as an elder. It should be descriptor of you as a Christian. When you show up to church on a Sunday, show up like an animal on the hunt. I have a picture up there of an African hunting dog, an African wild dog. I want to tell you about African wild dogs. I think my son Andrew told me about them initially. They're actually pretty cool. They're they're not particularly strong, but they are extremely successful hunters. They're actually the highest, they have the highest kill efficiency of any large predator. Meaning if they lock in on an animal, that thing's going down. Right? They, they hunt in packs. They coordinate efforts. Once they start the chase, they just don't give up. When they decide to attack, they pursue their prey relentlessly often running it to exhaustion. If one of the dogs gets tired, the next one picks up while that one rests. They take turns chasing the animal down until they get it. If any single individual can't take down the target animal, the pack works together. They're known to be very strategic in pursuing their prey. They communicate, they coordinate. Oftentimes when they see a pack of prey, They take down the entire group, leaving not even a single survivor. Almost nothing escapes them when they hunt. Each individual works diligently to accomplish their task in the hunt, and together they're unstoppable. 
And I learned about these while I was studying uh, Romans 12. And you, you could see why that, like, that is a good illustration for us. I, I hope it gives you a picture. You can see it right there. That is a dog whose ears are attuned, its eyes are locked in. It's making a plan. It's going to get what it hunts. Imagine the impact of Grace Bible Church if we took this command from Romans 12, 3 seriously. If we came to church each Sunday, small group each Tuesday or Thursday, to each other's homes throughout the week, we prayed like this. We ran errands like this. We planned for use of our stuff like this. Imagine if we all, as a pack, were functioning like African wild dogs. But rather than to kill things, to show them hospitality, to show them God's love in the gospel. I think we'd be a little bit like the early church where it could be said they, they had one they were united together, one heart, one mind, and they didn't have a need among them. Imagine the difference. You come to church like this. Do you think about each other like this? I, I can't play the role of the Holy Spirit telling you all the different ways that you might be most effective in hunting. Each of us, God is gifted differently. Each of us has different amount of stuff. Each of us has eyes to see needs differently. Pray for each other. We have a meeting, a group of people that, that meet before the service, before equipping hour, 815 over in this room, come together. One of the things that we regularly pray for is that the body would be aware of the needs of the body and that something supernatural would happen here. The Holy Spirit in each one of us wouldn't let a need go unmet. We pray that God would accomplish this. Come to that meeting, pray, and then go hunt. Or know that there are people praying for you when you're on your way. When you get up in the morning, prepare to hunt. When you go to bed Saturday night, prepare to hunt on Sunday. Don't hunt only on Sunday. And remember, what we are hunting is opportunities to treat each other, people who are not your family, as if they are your family, meeting their needs with your stuff, especially in your homes. As I look out and I see, I, it's just, it's so encouraging because I know I'm not teaching something that you guys don't already embrace. I, it's f fun as I'm making eye contact. I'm like, yeah, they do that and they do that and they do that. And uh, so, so as I go into some practical considerations for hospitality hunting, this is, list is far from exhaustive. I might not even be the best person to help you come up with a list because there's so many people here who do certain aspects of this so much better than I could even imagine. But the take-home point is pursue it. So some practical considerations for hospitality hunting. You have to plan for it. First, you, you have to plan for hospitality. Prepare meals in advance, right? If you're coming, you don't know who you're going to have over. There might be a need. You're going to look for one. There must be a need out there. Maybe somebody would benefit. There's a lonely person. There's a person who needs to talk. Maybe there's somebody who just doesn't have a meal. Plan for it. Prepare meals in advance for a Sunday. Meals that can sit in the kitchen, that you can, in the fridge, that you can make on a short notice. You weren't planning on making a meal. There's a need. You get a phone call. You're aware of something. Can you come over? We talk about that. Can, can you come over and have dinner with us? Be part of our family. You planned for that. You didn't know that you were going to find out at 430 that somebody in the body of Christ had a legitimate need. But you planned, you prepared, and you were ready. Make lists, lists of people to pray for. Uh, if you're praying for people constantly, regularly in the morning, at your lunch break, 
before bed, you're, you're going to be more aware of them and more, more ready to, to see the needs and then to meet the needs. And not just in a spasmodic, one-time kind of way, but in a consistent follow-up, a, a way that, that genuinely shows you're not just my family today and I'm going to forget about it tomorrow, but this is a need that might not go away for a really long time. I'm going to keep it in front of you and I'm going to pray and I'm going to day after day week after week, month after month, sometimes year after year, meet those needs as I can. Make lists of people. Make lists of meals that you can prepare so that you're not like, oh, shoot, what am I going to make? What am I going to bring them? List of meals. Make lists of preferences. I know there's a number of people here who like know what everybody in the church likes to eat, what everybody is allergic to, what everybody's favorite, favorite restaurants are, even more, more practically knows what, what somebody really needs. Oh, this person isn't going to be able to change their air filters. They're alone. They're frail. I'm going to actually go to their home and do that for them. We, we have a whole ministry here, the Barnabas ministry, devoted to that. It's sort of our efforts to make sure that that doesn't fall through the cracks specifically for widows. Don't let the Barnabas ministry do it all. <laughs> you, we do that ourselves as the body of everybody is out hunting ways to meet these needs. Um, there won't be a lot of needs left. Make lists, lists to guide your prayers, lists to guide your service, lists to prepare, plan time for hospitality. As best you can, don't pack your schedule so full so that when needs arise, you're unable to meet them. The reality is all of our lives are busy. They're all full. And we can't each meet every need. But if all of us have our lives so full that we can't meet needs when they arise, I think we're falling short of this command to actually let love be genuine and to pursue hospitality. A a means of pursuing hospitality is to plan time Leave your schedule open or plan to be showing hospitality after church during the week. Don't make every night about yourself in your family, in your home, living for you. Be more, be more aware of other people's needs than you are of your own. Right? That's a mark of a Christian is to be more aware of other people's needs than you are of your own and plan your time accordingly. That, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, Guys, you'll make time for yourself. You have no problem. I have no problem making time for myself. And that command is so impossibly high. Part of, part of loving my neighbor will be to plan for my neighbor, plan time for my neighbor. After church, during the week, especially during holiday season, think of the, the holidays coming up. For those, for some people, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all the busyness, it's so filled with stuff. You feel like you have no margins. For others, it's a constant reminder of aloneness. I see the world celebrating. I see the world together in families. They have no time for anything because they're just together with family. They're celebrating. And, And even if that's not true, that's the way it might look. Have strangers in your home for Thanksgiving. For Christmas. This is something that this church does well. We can continue to do well and even do better. And this month coming up is a sweet opportunity to hunt hospitality by planning for having people in your home, especially when it's hard, especially when your life is full. And especially to meet the needs of those who don't have uh, homes and families to celebrate the holidays with. That was a plan for hospitality. Let's pray for hospitality. I think we should start there by just confessing our selfishness, our pride and disobedience that may have hindered you from opening your home to others. I'm up here teaching this night. I'm aware. 
and I'm confessing to God, and he is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. I have evidences of selfishness, pride, and disobedience that have hindered at times my opportunities to show hospitality. May that never be. And because hospitality flows from the gospel, because your, your effort when you realize, yeah, I haven't been doing this, it isn't first and most to say, I need to try harder. It's probably true that you need to try harder. You need to plan better. You need to pursue it better. But if there's been sin, start with just confession. Agree with God. And then let your pursuing hospitality actually be a fruit of repentance. Not, a re- not one with, with regret, but without regret that leads to life and will actually glorify God. So pray, confess sins, then pray for opportunities and pray for the diligence to take those opportunities. Pray for those that you intend to invite over. If you have your eyes on somebody and say, that person, I know I need to pursue them in hospitality, pray for them throughout the week. Pray for them with your kids. Pray for them with your spouse. Consider them in prayer deeply throughout the week throughout the month, maybe throughout the day before, so that when they're over, you've already thought long and hard and you've prayed long and hard that God would superintend your efforts to accomplish something far more. Pray that God would make you aware of needs and make you prepared to meet them, that he'd give you eyes to see the needs that are around that might be hard to figure out, hard to find. Pray prayers of worship and adoration for God's hospitality to you. So plan for hospitality. Pray for hospitality. Personalize your hospitality. Each person will have a unique ability and a unique limitation. Right? You might be tempted to think right now, oh, I can't wait till I have a nice family and a big home. Someday I'll show hospitality. Or you might think, I, I can't do it. I, 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 have a ho- I have a small house and roommates. They'll never let me show hospitality. Or man, you might be thinking, I have a full house with a lot of kids. This is hard. There's always a reason to not. And with each one of those limitations, there's actually like a superpower in there. There's some way that you have been uniquely gifted, uniquely positioned within your limitations, also with your abilities. If you're single and you don't have a home, do you know what you might have? Time and flexibility. If you're married and you, are, and you have young kids all over, and you're like, I can't have somebody over. My house is a constant mess. Life is busy. It's hectic. I can't plan. Do you know what you have? An inviting home to invite somebody into, maybe a a younger married couple that doesn't have kids yet who wants to, and you can help them see what it is uh, to have a godly family. Maybe an older couple who, who wishes they could, could be back in those days and would just actually enjoy the, the noise of laughing, sometimes crying kids. There's opportunities in that also to care for others. Clean your house with a higher motivation than just having a clean house, but an opportunity to care for others. Talk to your kids. Train your kids to be submissive, obedient, faithful, with a higher calling than just to have a a well-kept home, but opportunity to actually, kids, let's use our stuff to show hospitality. Use your family as part of your hospitality hunting. Each recipient has unique needs, right? Every, everybody who you have an opportunity to show hospitality to has a unique need. And every single person showing hospitality has unique gifts, unique things that they own, unique season of life, unique opportunities. And God has formed the body in this way with a diversity of gifts Diversity of situations, people, priorities, preferences, so that when the body comes together, each part joined just in the way that God has designed it, the body causes the growth of the body in love. 
Our homes will be a place where that happens. They must be a place where that happens. Our stuff must not be off limits as that happens. Prioritize others in hospitality. It's easy to have ourselves. This is hospitality in the world puts us on the pedestal. It says, look at me. I'll have you over when it's convenient for me, when it makes me look good. Prioritize others in hospitality. Show hospitality to those who can't repay. Show hospitality to those who really need it. Show hospitality in a way that doesn't play merely to your strengths, but plays to their needs. That's what Jesus says in Luke 14, 12. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, invite those who can't pay, who can't repay. When you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they don't have the means to repay you. You'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Be careful of creating an indebtedness in others towards you or doing it so that you get honor. Put your gifts to use in hospitality. Play to your strengths. Whether you're single, married with children, families without children, empty nesters, retirees, old, older singles, widows, widowers, each of you has needs, but each of you has a strength. Play to those strengths. In the command in 1 Peter 4, 9, where he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling, the next verse says, as each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given you exactly what you need to walk in the good works that he's put before you. You can't say, oh, but God, you didn't give me enough stuff to share. God, you, you didn't make me an outgoing person. I'm sort of an introvert. I don't, I don't like this. I'm reminded of God's words to Moses when he says, I can't go, I can't speak. And God says, uh, who made your tongue? Who made you mute? Oh, I made you the way you are. If I've given you command, I'll accomplish it. Now go. Partner with others in hospitality. It's like the hunting dogs. They're not on their own. They can't take down big prey on their own. Partner with others. Some have homes. Others have time. If we combine efforts, we can be more effective. Practice humility in hospitality. Hospitality does not mean let me show you my stuff. It means let me care for you. Provide a welcoming environment. Clean your home if possible, but the goal isn't perfection. It's not make an Instagram-ready home at all times, but rather one that can be lived in by you and can be you can invite others into your home. So, so plan in your home space. Even the furniture that you have, the way that you use your bedrooms. Do you have a, an extra bedroom that you could make ready for somebody in need? Prep your kids, your roommates, on how to be welcoming in hospitality. How to act when people are there. How to think in advance. How to clean up. How do you continue care in the aftermath of hospitality? If you have kids, sometimes in hospitality, we have to prep our kids. We have a code word. If we use that word or that suggestion, it doesn't mean maybe go down to the other side of the house. It means we're going to have a conversation you shouldn't be here for. Go, and if there's other kids that we're treating, take them with you. Use that. Make code words, prep in advance, anticipate together. Provision your space for hospitality. Like I said, spare bedroom, maybe a hospitality basket ready to go. Spare bedroom or casita, maybe just drinks in the fridge. You come up with that. Position yourself for spontaneity. And most of all, preach the gospel and theology to your heart and home. Hospitality isn't the source of a, cha isn't the source of a changed heart. It isn't the source of a home shepherded to God, but it is the fruit of it. Preach the gospel in your home. Preach the gospel to yourself. Have times together as a family regularly where you open God's word and you say, how must this affect us? 
And the answer is it must affect, yeah, the way we live together as a home, but the way we use our home and our ministry to outsiders, especially Christians. Plan together, be specific, pursue it, hunt it. Not for your glory, but God's glory. As good stewards of the gifts that God's given us, let's hunt hospitality together. Let's pray. God, thank you for each gift that you've given us. God, thank you for the the money that we have and even the needs that we have. Each one of these are provided by you for your glory. God, where there's a need, I pray we would be content and meet it. Where there's provision, I pray that we would be content and ready to give to give our stuff up. God, I pray that we would do all of this with our eyes on you. We have received so much grace. You've reconciled us to you while we were your enemies. While we were children of Satan, you have made us your child. And you've prepared a place for us. God, I pray that we would prepare, plan, pursue each other for your glory and hospitality. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.